Genesis 3 recounts the fall of humanity through our priestly representatives of Adam and Eve. But what exactly happened which resulted in exile from Eden? Did God place an evil tree in a sacred garden? Isn't knowledge of good and evil a good thing? There are many interesting concepts that need to be looked at more in depth. The common belief among many people today is that in the garden there were two trees, one being the tree of life, which was good, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which was a bad tree that was placed there in order to test Adam and Eve. However, this assumption about the second tree results in theological and textual problems. First, the Garden of Eden was considered to be a sacred space that was ordered properly and represented all that was good. So why would God include an evil tree in the midst of all of this? If Eden was the first temple, nothing should have been included that was not ordered for good or that should have caused problems. This would be like including a table with lines of cocaine in your church welcome center. Even if there was a sign that read, Do not snort, it would seem like an odd addition and represent disorder in a place that was meant to honor God. Second, God never suggests the tree of knowledge of good and evil was an evil tree. In Genesis 3, the woman notes it's in the midst or middle of the garden, meaning it was at the center of the sacred space. You wouldn't put what was evil and displeasing at the center of your temple. Imagine a church putting a statue of Buddha center stage. Such a move would not make sense and would suggest the creators of the church were out of line or corrupt. Because of these issues, it is difficult to suggest the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a bad thing. In fact, it seems the tree was good along with the tree of life. Knowledge of good and evil is portrayed as a good thing in the Bible. As Kenneth Matthews says, There is no apparent reason why God would have prohibited this. This would imply that perhaps the issue wasn't eating from the tree, but how Adam and Eve went about eating from the tree. Think of how Satan tempted Christ in the wilderness when he offered him all the kingdoms of the world. What Satan offered Christ was not bad, Paul tells us Christ's rulership over all the kingdoms of the earth began after his resurrection. The temptation Satan offered was to bypass the appropriate and necessary processes and seizing them instantly. In other words, the issue was not going about it through God's timing and plan. Sex is not bad or evil. There is even a graphic book in the Bible about how wonderful sex is. But sex with children is abhorrently wrong. In other words, it's not that we think people should never have sex, but that they should wait until they are mature and committed in a marriage covenant. Likewise, the sin in the garden was not eating from the tree, but eating from the tree of knowledge for the wrong reasons and not according to God's timing and plan. Since the text doesn't imply the tree was evil, there is no reason to suggest that God would never have allowed them to gain this knowledge. In fact, the Bible has several examples of God bestowing wisdom upon people according to his plan and time. The issue was Adam and Eve were not ready for this level of knowledge, and they seized it for personal and selfish gains. This makes far more sense than the idea God placed an evil tree in his sacred garden to test them. As we noted in our previous videos, God's call of humanity was about electing creatures to work with him in bringing order to the cosmos. But this would imply a working relationship where God brings humanity to a more insightful and ethical place. Michael Heiser notes God's goal was to bring humanity into the divine council. So the issue in the garden was Adam and Eve chose to seize control and knowledge for themselves, not trust God to bring this knowledge to them at the appropriate time. John Walton says, By disobediently taking the fruit, they were trying to be like God by positing themselves as the center and source of order. In taking from the tree, Adam and Eve were trying to set themselves up as a satellite center of wisdom apart from God. It is a childish sort of response, I can do it myself, or I want to do it my way. 
These are not a rejection of authority per se, but an insistence on independence. If humans are to work alongside of God, in extending order, they need to attain wisdom, but as endowment from God, not by seizing it for autonomous use. Their sin was trying to be like God for selfish and prideful reasons, and this can be seen in the first thing Eve says. The Nahash addresses Eve, but uses a plural form for the word you, implying they are both present at this exchange. He asks if they are able to eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the sacred space, and Eve gives an odd reply. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. There are two things in this statement that are incorrect. First, commentators have noted Eve added to the command of God. God never said they could not touch the tree, only that they could not eat of it. Parallels to this can be seen in the New Testament. Jesus charged the Pharisees with forsaking the law of God for the sake of their own traditions. In other words, the Pharisees added additional traditions to the commands of God because they assumed the additional traditions would aid them in keeping the laws of God. However, Jesus said the additions only caused them to break the laws of God, not aid them like they assumed. Eve had set up her own tradition in order to stay away from the tree. However, this legalistic mindset ultimately led to her downfall. She had trusted in her own traditions to keep her safe. Robert Alter notes, As many commentators have observed, Eve enlarges the divine prohibition in another direction, adding a ban on touching to the one on eating, and so perhaps setting herself up for transgression. Having touched the fruit and seeing no ill effect, she may proceed to eat. Thus, before even eating of the tree, Adam and Eve had already placed a lack of trust in the word of God to keep them safe, and through pride and arrogance, they had already begun the fall, by placing more trust in their own plan and traditions, and not the plan of God. The Nahash only exploited this seed of sin that was already growing inside of them. The second issue with the woman's words is she misrepresents God's warning of eating from the tree. God did not say they will die, but that they would be doomed to die. Many translations render this as you shall surely die, but scholars like Robert Alter and John Walton note doomed to die more or less captures the warning God gives to Adam in Genesis 2. In other words, eating from the tree would not cause immediate death, but it would eventually result if Adam and Eve ate from this tree without permission. Now it would seem that Nahash corrects Eve in the English, because he repeats back to her that they will not surely die. But this is not really the case. God's statement in Genesis 2 is an absolute infinitive coupled with a finite verb of the same root. However, the Nahash uses a slightly different construction. In his phrase, the negative participle precedes both verb forms. So the Nahash is more or less saying, don't think that death is such an imminent threat. So in other words, the Nahash doesn't actually lie, but only points out that Eve's belief that they will immediately die is false. The Nahash plays on her misuse of God's words to lead to their downfall. Thus, the Nahash tempted Adam and Eve in a similar way he will later tempt Christ, by offering the fulfillment of God's plan on their own terms through deviant and selfish methods. Although the man of dust failed, the man from heaven did not. Much debate has been given about what the tree specifically did to Adam and Eve. Suggestions reign from sexual knowledge, rapid physical maturity, and large brains, and many other theories. However, a better understanding can be found by looking at similar gifts God gives in Scripture. In 1 Kings 3, Solomon asked for wisdom from God, but specifically asked that he would have the knowledge to discern between good and evil. This is granted to him, and he becomes a king full of wisdom and understanding beyond measure. Likewise, the tree of knowledge of good and evil likely bestowed the similar type of wisdom granted to Solomon. As we noted in our video on Genesis 2, Adam was viewed as a priest-king over creation, and like Solomon, God's plan 
probably would have included bestowing wisdom on the two rulers in Eden, which is why the tree would have been placed there in the first place. This type of divinely bestowed wisdom doesn't mean they did not know what good and evil were prior to taking this gift. It simply means they gained a deeper sense of understanding and a wiser outlook. However, unlike Solomon, Adam and Eve seized this godly wisdom for themselves in a prideful and sinful fashion. This was the sin of Eden, trying to become like God for selfish gains, not for noble or ethical reasons, like with Solomon. Kenneth Matthews says, It has long been recognized that features of the garden story bear strong resemblance to wisdom literature and themes. The wisdom tradition declares that wisdom is passed by God and is humanity's proper goal of attainment. Proverbs indicates, however, that it must be achieved through fear of the Lord and not through grasping it independently. By obtaining it through disobedience, the first couple express their independence of God and obtain wisdom possessed by God through moral autonomy. Furthermore, Matthews notes similarities to elements of the tabernacle setup in Israel's camp. The two garden trees are comparable to those elements in the tabernacle that represent life and the law of God. The candlestick was shaped like a tree with branches symbolizing life, giving light to the twelve loaves of bread that represented God's provision for Israel. The commands of God were exemplified by the stone tablets and the Ark of the Covenant. In the same way the tree of knowledge was indicative of God's commands to be obeyed, lest the curse of disobedience fall upon the lawbreaker. By allusion, Psalm 19.8-10 compares the law with the tree of knowledge and shows that it is superior, providing a knowledge obtained only through revelation. As disobedience meant death in the garden, transgressors of God's law in Israel experienced its deathly consequences. The God of the tabernacle was indeed the God of the garden. And more importantly, as the tabernacle symbolizes the presence of God among his people, the descriptive language of the garden's habitat declares that God is present with the first man. The tabernacle for Israel indicated the place of communion with God, and similarly, it was the garden that God and man first enjoyed that communion. However, the tree not only made them wise, but also shameful. In obtaining wisdom of good and evil, their eyes would have been open to the sin they just committed and why it was wrong. A childlike trust in God would have been lost that is later called for by Christ for all people to have regardless of age. Adam and Eve forsook this trust and dependence on God and shame would have resulted and thus a feeling of nakedness internally and externally came about. Throughout the Bible, nakedness refers to a feeling of being exposed and shameful. Walter Vogel states, the primary significance of nudity is not sexual. Nudity refers to poverty, weakness, and human limitations. To be nude before someone indicates that you have nothing to hide, that you are showing yourself as you are. Stephen Lambden agrees. Since nakedness in the Hebrew Bible usually refers to the loss of human and social dignity, the primordial nakedness and unashamedness most probably indicates that human relationships were originally characterized by innocence and mutual trust and respect before God. Numerous biblical passages support this reading. Isaiah 47 says Babylon shall be disgraced for all to see, and this means her nakedness shall be uncovered. Leviticus 18 refers to uncovering nakedness as disgraceful and shameful sexual acts. Habakkuk 2.15 says the Chaldeans intentionally get people drunk to stare at their nakedness, which refers to watching drunkards act shamefully while they are inebriated. And interestingly, Hebrews 4.13 refers to God's omniscience by saying all creatures are naked and exposed to Him, implying sin cannot be hidden from God. Likewise, the feeling of nakedness in the garden probably more broadly refers to the shame of their sin. Yet there is no issue in believing they literally also felt the need to cover themselves with clothes. This can be seen in how Adam and Eve follow this act by hiding themselves directly from God. If the whole issue was just realizing they needed clothes and not the shame of sin, after they sewed fig leaves for loincloths, they should not have felt the need to hide themselves from God. The internal feeling of shame often makes people feel the need to hide and cover themselves externally. 
thus the need to cover themselves and hide would be a natural response to feeling the regret and shame of their sin. What then follows is the punishments given by God for their transgression. These have often been misunderstood to seem harsher than what is actually stated. Much of what is spoken by God is simply a natural result of their sin. It should also be noted, the curses probably do not apply to every man or woman, as not every man has worked the ground and not every woman has born children. Just like the curses placed on the Nahash only apply to that being, these are probably only directed at Adam and Eve. First, to the woman, her pain will be multiplied in childbearing, her desire shall be towards her husband, but he will rule over her. This word for pain is a noun, and the verbal root occurs numerous times to refer to grief, anxiety, or worry, not physical labor pains. Also, the Hebrew word for childbearing more refers to conception. So the text refers to conception anxiety, not the idea of the pain of the human birthing process was multiplied and that it was pain-free prior to the fall. Living in a fallen state without God's perfect order will cause more worry and anxiety over children and the future of what that will bring. Next, this term for desire has shown to be extremely controversial. It only shows up three times in the Hebrew Bible, and there is no common usage between all three. However, John Walton argues it simply refers to basic instinct or nature, and it should be understood with the prior statements regarding conception. Basically, in the woman's fallen state, conception will greatly increase anxiety, but she will still have a natural or instinctive desire to have children. So her desire to have children will be for her husband, since she will need her husband to produce children, and that naturally will result in dominance. To better explain this, Herbert Brichto says, The basic idea here is that the woman's desire, which renders her dependent, is traceable to her need to fulfill her maternal instinct. For now, let us recall what sociologists have called the principle of lesser or least interest. In a relationship involving two partners, the one with the greater need of the other is the more vulnerable, while the one with the lesser interest in the relationship is in a position of dominance. So what verse 16 is saying is a woman will be in a fallen state. Her anxiety over her children and their future conditions will increase, which the principle of least interest in sociology states will mean her husband will rule over her, as her maternal instincts will result in there being more vulnerability in the relationship and thus ruled over. In other words, the fallen state they chose simply comes with natural consequences. Next, what are the consequences for the man? It says the ground is cursed, in pain you shall eat of it all your days, thorns and thistles shall bring forth, in order to obtain bread there will be hard labor, and through all of that death will eventually come. First, to curse something does not necessarily mean to physically or magically change it. It is the opposite of the Hebrew word to bless, which means to put someone or something under God's protection. With that in mind, Cursing does not mean to put a hex on something, so by God cursing the ground, he is simply removing his protection and favor over it. Now that man has decided they want to rule instead of God, he will remove his blessing over the ground, and outside of the garden, food will be harder to obtain. This verse does not suggest that thorns and thistles did not exist prior to the fall, only that without the blessing of God on the land, it will not be in perfect harmony and the ground that man works outside of the garden will have to deal with weeds and harsh plants, something that would have been absent in a garden run by God. John Walton says, As a result of the ground being removed from God's favor, protection, and blessing, it will yield its produce only through hard labor. The word the NIV translates painful toil is the same word used in the first line of 316 that was interpreted above as anguish. The impact of this curse is that though food is still available to people, it will be much harder to produce it. It should also be noted that Adam seems to suggest that God was merciful on them. Joshua John Van E says, It is best to say that God was merciful. He does not bring about the threatened judgment on the man and the woman. A restraint is seen elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible. Such an understanding would also explain Adam's reaction to God's curses. He named his wife Eve, meaning life. Adam understood he had received mercy. 
In other words, Adam named his wife Eve because their lives were spared. Although they were still doomed to die, as God warned, they were not immediately sentenced to death, as they originally assumed in the beginning of the chapter. Some suggest this verse proves Eve is the mother of all humans, and that there could not have been any other humans alive before them. But this is unlikely, given what we went over in Genesis 2, and the phrase, mother of all living, in no way can be understood to be literal. Eve is not the mother of all the animals, or Adam. Also in Genesis 4 it reads, Ada bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother was Jubal. He is the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. In no way are these two literally the father of every single person who has one of these professions. Being the mother of all living is simply assigning Eve a special place as a leading figure among all life, and she should be looked to as a guiding role. In conjunction with this, a lot of people have argued the sin of Adam and Eve resulted with physical death, entering the world for the first time, by drawing on Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. But this doesn't make sense with the context. Just after this, Paul says the death he is talking about reigned from Adam to Moses. Okay, this cannot be physical death, because people still died after Moses, and still die today. In verse 17 and 18, Paul contrasts life and death with condemnation and the grace found in Christ. So it should be obvious, Paul is referring to spiritual death, not the first time physical death entered the world. Moses was seen as the one who brought God's people back into his presence within a sacred space called the Promised Land. In Eden, mankind was exiled from God's presence and received condemnation or spiritual death. Moses was seen as the one who ended this and brought humanity back into a special covenant with God, where people could approach his presence like in Eden. Romans 5 is simply highlighting this, and thus Paul is talking about spiritual death, not physical death. This correlates with what happens in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve's bodies are not cursed or changed from immortal to mortal. All that happens is they are exiled, so they cannot gain access to the tree of life. Their sin results in all humanity being estranged from God, as until Moses, we did not have a priest to mediate for us. And this also shows eternal life was obtained by eating from the tree of life. Death would naturally resolve without it, implying Adam and Eve were already mortal. Their sentence dooms them to die away from life and the presence of God. However, it should also be noted that God's act of exiling them from Eden doesn't mean he has fully abandoned them. Genesis 4 notes their sons are still sacrificing the God and communing with him, although probably not as easily as it would have been in Eden. The text of Genesis 3 reads that Adam named his wife Eve, noting God was merciful on them. Then this is followed by the text saying God clothed them with garments of skin. Clothing someone is a ritualistic act of covering them with favor and protection. Priests and kings were given special garments and installation ceremonies. Joseph was both clothed by his father with a special coat and clothed by Pharaoh when he was appointed to high office to show special favor. However, in contrast, Adam and Eve are actually demoted when they are clothed, as they can no longer commune with God in the garden. But the clothing process should be seen as God is still covering them and allowing them to keep a modified priestly role. Grace has been given to them despite their act of rejecting God's role as head over their lives. Walton says, This provision should probably be seen as an act of grace by God, preparing them of the more difficult environment he is sending them into, providing a remedy for their newly developed shame. Insofar as animal death is likely in the system, there is nothing unusual about using animal skin for a garment. Finally, sentence is passed on them. Humans are exiled from the garden because they are unworthy to keep eating from the tree of life to maintain immortality. Adam and Eve have demonstrated what they desire is to selfishly rule and use the gifts of God for personal advantages. Allowing them to remain immortal 
would mean these seeds of their pride and sin would only live forever alongside of them. God sends them out to learn the consequences of their actions and what self-centeredness will do to humanity. The harsh truth of life without God's lordship must be realized to its full extent if any of humanity is to be saved. Thus, Adam and Eve will be sent out to do as they already wanted, to be the center of wisdom and order for the cosmos. Instead of taking God's route, they will learn what the knowledge of good and evil are to their full extent through experience instead of through God's wisdom. But despite the belief it was better for them to grasp wisdom on their own terms, things are about to get much worse. Humanity begins to descend into disorder, having craved knowledge on their own terms, instead of letting the fear of the Lord be the beginning of wisdom. The beginnings of these effects are carried out in Genesis 4.